Shabbat Shalom. Oh, good. Everything is working. This morning, while we were reading the Torah, we read of an episode in Jacob's life which arguably shows him at his very best. Jacob's a tricky character in every sense of the word. He's a trickster, he's a deceiver, he's a planner, he's a counterfeiter. But there is this one episode that shows him really in a different light. And I want us to take a closer look at it. And if you want to have the text in front of you as well, it's in the red books on page 201. If you do not have the red books with you, fear not. I will be telling you where it is. <coughs> it begins, Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the break of dawn. When he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he wrenched Jacob's hip at its socket, so the socket of his hip was strained as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for dawn is breaking. But he, Jacob, answered, I will not let you go unless you bless me. This is one of those passages that just bubbles with potential questions. Who is the man who erupts so aggressively into the text? What is the meaning of that injury and why is the injury precisely where it is? And what is that blessing all about? Our commentators generally agree that this is not an ordinary man, and that's not really a surprise, is it? Jacob has a supernatural opponent, generally understood that Jacob is fighting an angel. And the portrayal of that angel has been the source of inspiration for visual artists throughout the ages. One of the very enjoyable things about preparing this sermon was Googling images, Jacob and the angel. And you get pages and pages of what people have done with that image. Painting, sculpture, modern, classical, ancient. And I recommend, after Shabbat is over, a Google. My personal favorite is Jacob Epstein, the sculpture, which I've seen live and which I recommend. But in our tradition, in the Jewish tradition, as the commentary to the Eitz Chaim notes, the angel is not perceived as angelic in the way that we would normally understand the word. The angel is perceived as malignant. Some say that it is the demon of that particular river that Jacob was standing at, and others say that it is the Tsar, the leader, the governing spirit of Esau a kind of personification of Esau's murderous rage against his brother. And Jacob has been running away from that rage for years and years and years. And finally, as so often in stories of heroes, he has to turn round and finally face down what has been pursuing him. And if that is the case, if this angel is Esau's personal spirit, if you will, then the struggle with the angel represents the final lancing of everything that has gone wrong with these two brothers in the past, so that in the morning they can reconcile and move on and decide how they are going to continue their relationship. And there are other Jewish commentators who suggest that, no, the struggle is between Jacob and a personification of his internal reality, his internal world, his conscience maybe, maybe his fears. And then what we would be looking at in that struggle is a dark night of the soul from which we could and should expect Jacob to emerge transformed. But I find myself most drawn to the family of commentators who identify that angel as a personification of evil itself. Last week, I was studying with my study partner, who I think is back there, Rabbi Yael Seidoff, and we looked at the interpretation of the Ma'or Enayim, Rabbi Nachum of Chernobyl, the Hasid, who says that Jacob's struggle is with the Sitra Achra, Jacob's struggle is with the dark side. How, in a week in which we have Harry Potter 7, could I not talk about the dark side? 
But the Maori name pre-Harry Potter was being serious. The angel is the personification of everything that is negative. And that's why it's on the back of the body, on the sciatic nerve, that this particular angel leaves its mark. And Rabbi Yehuda Lieb Hasman, who was head of the yeshiva in Skuszyn in Poland in the 1900s, explains that the proof that this is evil incarnate is that the angel will not tell Jacob its name. Evil does not have a name. No. Evil is a black hole. Evil is nameless. Its strength comes from blindness and fantasy. Evil is the screen onto which we project our worst fears, our worst fantasies, and then we can paralyze ourselves with terror. So perhaps what Jacob is fighting is evil itself. And if that is the case, what can we learn from the way that the Torah tells us about Jacob's struggle with evil. Well, the first thing we learn is that it's messy. The verb to wrestle in Hebrew, avek, is taken from the word for dust. When you wrestle, you kick up dust. It would appear that rolling around in the dirt, clawing, kicking, is endemic to the way that we have to struggle against evil. It's not a clean, tidy business. We have no lightsabers with which to zap it. No, it takes all night and we get very, very dirty in the process. Second, though, is that at the end of the struggle, if we stick at it for long enough, if, as Rabbi Bernhard was saying to Henry, if we persevere, then the evil will eventually plead for us to let it go. The angel pleads with Jacob, send me away for dawn is breaking. And I can't help but be reminded of those beautiful lines from Psalm 30 that we say in the morning service. Weeping lies down at night, but joy comes in the morning. There is something about the light of morning. There is something about the clarity that it brings, which is inimical to evil and which puts it to flight. Evil can't survive the clear light of daytime. And if we can bring light into the struggle, then evil has to let us go. And, the and for the third lesson, if you'll forgive me, I need to back up a little. Those of you who learn with me, and I have the privilege in this synagogue of learning with a good many of you, those of you who learn with me know that I often cite an exercise that I was taught by Professor Uriel Simon of Bar Ilan University, who says that we miss out on a full reading, a full understanding of the Torah because we think we know it. We think we know what's coming next. And the fact that we think we know what's coming next will often block us to reading it with the sensitivity that we need to use. And his